Hello and welcome to Natstat Conversations. I am Pankaj Saran and a host for this next episode of our discussion series. Today uh, I am very happy that we have with us a guest from uh, outside Delhi, uh, someone who's come from Mumbai uh, and who is a very unique person because he uh, has uh, written uh, he participates in international conflict resolution and does so many other strategic uh, things which impact India's security. And also, uh, he's a thinker, he's a thought leader. Uh, I want you to welcome uh, Sandeep Vaslekar. Uh, hi, Sandeep, and welcome to Natstat Conversations. Uh, Sandeep was, uh, is the president of the Strategic Foresight Group a think tank based in Mumbai, author of three books. We'll talk about that shortly. He has been involved in many diplomatic exercises across the world, dealing with heads of government, Nobel laureates, peacemaking between India and Pakistan, in Nepal. He's seen it all. And he's, um, his most recent uh, book, uh, A World Without War, is something which is here and uh, you should see it. And we will be talking about it and asking Sandeep, what is it? Uh, that agitates his mind, uh, what are the issues that bother him, what are the issues that he thinks about, uh, and uh, enlighten us with his perspective. So, Sandeep, welcome to uh, Natstrat Conversations. Tell me, uh, let's begin with actually your book. And uh, it's a long story. We've discussed it many times. It was released a few months ago in Delhi. I know you've been to Geneva to participate in uh, further launches, etc., uh, etc. Et so, firstly, uh, why did you write the book, and how do you assess uh, the response the book has had? And uh, if you can, uh, just tell us the principal messages uh, of the book uh, in 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 layman's language. Well, thank you, uh, Pankaj, for inviting me. And first of all, I want to congratulate you on launching Natstrat. Thank you. I thank think you very Delhi much. needs. Uh, uh, and India needs uh, a strong think tank with rigorous research capacity. And uh, thank you. And 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 uh, welcome to Natrite on the think tank scene. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you. Learning from you. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, we all learn from each other. So in uh, 2019, a group of Nobel laureates came together. Nobel Peace laureates came together in Caen in Normandy in France, and. Uh, uh, I was invited to convene this meeting, though I'm not a Nobel laureate, of course. Uh, no, but the no government of Normandy asked me to, to convene this meeting of uh, 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 four Nobel laureates and a one prominent philosopher. Mm -hmm. So these Nobel laureates were Mohamed El Bardaik, uh, Lema Bovi, Jody Williams, Dennis Mukwege. And uh, we had a well-known philosopher from, uh, from Britain, uh, A.C. Grayling. Mm -hmm. And they issued Normandy Manifesto for World Peace. Mm -hmm. And this manifesto uh, gave a signal that the world is very close to the risk of uh, human extinction. Mm -hmm. oh. Now, this is more dangerous than anything else that you can uh, uh, think of. And for six months, I was negotiating the draft of this manifesto with these Nobel Peace laureates. And we were on a daily basis discussing this issue of uh, uh, the changes in the world which are taking place, which can really lead to the extinction of uh, human civilization. Mm -hmm. In 1955, Russell and Einstein had issued the Russell-Einstein manifesto. And at that time, they had warned about the uh, existential threat to humanity. And now, many years later, many decades later, the threat had become much, much bigger. And it really sensitized me to, to how serious the threat is and also to the fact that people are not aware of it. Yeah. Or at least they are not sensitized to it. I mean, you don't see any discussion on the threat to I was in human fact, survival. Yeah, I was about to ask you. Yeah, there is no discussion on that at all. And it is, it is there not only because of nuclear weapons which is one of the main drivers uh, that could eventually lead to the, to the uh, extinction of human civilization. But it is also because of number of technological developments yeah. Yeah. 
which blend the lethality of nuclear weapons with the uh, some of the new technologies mm. for instance hypersonic missiles mm. now hypersonic missiles uh, their biggest uh, uh, characteristics or most significant characteristic is that uh, they decide their own trajectory mm. so the radars cannot detect them mm. now if hyper hypersonic missile is carrying a nuclear payload mm. and if it cannot be detected Yeah. and therefore if if an attack by hypersonic missile cannot be prevented mm. then uh, you have simply no way to call it back or to prevent the attack mm. so once you have pressed the button then hypersonic missile will hit its targets mm. and the moment any city is uh, among the nuclear weapon states is is attacked obviously there will be a counter attack yeah. and and i guess it will take uh, if it involves russia uh, china united states the big nuclear powers it may take maybe up to um, uh, you know uh, 24 hours or 48 hours one or two days mm. uh, for entire human civilization to uh, disappear mm. and not only human civilizations but even other flora and fauna sure, and, sure. and i mean many life forms will disappear sure. so this project of human civilization which has been uh, there for last 12000 years can disappear basically in 12 hours mm-hmm. and that's a huge huge risk yeah so uh, and, that's and and therefore i thought that this is something that should not be limited to a manifesto mm-hmm. but this should be brought to the attention of the of the global community at large mm-hmm. uh, of course even in india we are not so much aware of it we are not i mean we know about the nuclear threat from pakistan and from china but we are not thinking in terms of existential risk to mm-hmm. human civilization we have to be aware of it uh but even in the western world in asia in africa because even africa even though there is no nuclear weapon state in africa uh africa will be affected by it latin america of will course. be affected by i mean there is no part of the world which will be spared no part of the planet which will be spared so we are talking about the ultimate risk mm-hmm. and nuclear weapons which were weapons of mass destruction so far now with the combination of some of the new technologies uh they are becoming the weapons of final de- destruction yeah i i wanted to ask you about that so so that is the difference between the weapons of mass destruction and weapons of final destruction weapons mm-hmm. of mass destruction they could destroy cities they could destroy countries they could destroy region but weapons of final destruction would destroy uh, the entire humanity in its uh, finality mm-hmm. and and along with uh, hypersonic missiles which uh, i mentioned you have artificial intelligence you have uh, uh, cyber technology no cyber technology appears to be innocuous it's not just un, uh, you know downing websites uh, but for instance the early warning system in the nuclear command and control can be manipulated by cyber weapons mm-hmm. and uh, a nuclear weapon power might see vap- uh, some missiles are being launched at it by its enemy state just because of a cyber attack when the actual vip- missiles are not there that sounds very frightening mm-hmm. that is really and and then yeah. that nuclear weapon power might attack its enemy for no reason but yeah. because some terrorist group or a third party or somebody has uh, hacked uh, has hacked it and then the the country which has been attacked mm-hmm. that will anyway launch a real uh, mm-hmm. nuclear weapon mm-hmm. the second thing is that nuclear weapons uh, regime and the stability so far has been based on uh, deterrence right now with this new technologies the entire theory of deterrence has fallen apart mm-hmm. deterrence doesn't exist anymore mm-hmm. and there is no discussion on that that deterrence has uh, fallen so let, apart let me let me uh, come in here you you know you've you've painted a picture which is uh, scary and uh, very very troubling for everyone Firstly it's interesting that you as an Indian are actually taking this discussion to the rest of the world whereas uh, we have been used to the reverse traffic where when we went nuclear uh, we were told uh, and many many things about our nuclear capabilities etc but here i find that you as an Indian are actually coll- collaborating with nobel laureates and others to create awareness about this uh, whole threat but uh, what in your estimation is the response 
uh, to uh, this whole discussion. And uh, do you think it is uh, somewhat abstract uh, and not uh, kind of, uh, or do you think that the Ukraine conflict and the discussions and the, you know, statements that are being made on the use of tactical nuclear missiles uh, or weapons uh, in the Ukraine case um, is actually the right moment for this kind of messaging. Uh, and uh, uh, how do you therefore see, uh, do you actually see uh, the use of nuclear weapons ever in the near future, in the foreseeable future, in our lifetime? I mean, you pointed to these accidents and technologies, but uh, on a realistic basis, uh, how is the response that you are getting? That's a good question. First of all, at the moral and philosophical level, yeah. India has always advocated the philosophy of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Mm -hmm. Going back many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And the philosophy of Vasudeva Kutumbakam essentially means we all have to coexist together peacefully. Mm -hmm. Because word is a family and 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 uh, and and we have to live together as a family. We have sure. to. And so I feel that drawing from this philosophy that I have a philosophical right mm -hmm. to express my opinion about how the world should be governed. Mm -hmm. And it should not be just an intellectual right <clears throat> of the Western philosophers and Western thinkers to tell me how India should be governed or how Asia should be governed. Mm -hmm. So I am claiming a philosophical right Correct. Uh, uh, to, to shape a global public opinion as compared to the practical reality of the intellectual right that the Western yeah. uh, thinkers yeah. Have, yeah. and thought leaders have been exercising for last uh, few hundred years. Now, this is going off the beaten track. Mm. But I haven't stopped there. Mm. I am also trying to find solutions at the practical level. Mm. So, you asked me about the response to the book. So, one is that there is a response at the intellectual level and people find it interesting, they are discussing, but then the question comes, what do you do about it? Mm. So, I'm involved in an interesting exercise mm -hmm. to find an actual solution. Great. Great. And, 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 and to this question of, of, of nuclear risk. Yeah. And this exercise is Strategic Foresight Group is the think tank which I founded 20 years ago with colleagues. And Geneva Center for Security Policy in uh, Geneva, we are collaborating to begin a track to process on nuclear risk reduction. So, already as we speak now, we have consulted mm -hmm. with uh, leading experts in US, Russia, China, France and UK, the P5 countries and reached a broad framework on what are the nuclear risk reduction measures which would be potentially accepted to these five governments. Mm -hmm. There are a number of nuclear risk reduction measures which would not be acceptable to one or more of the five governments. But we have focused on trying to uh, uh, assess which would be yeah, so, accepted. So, uh, you are going from nuclear uh, arms control or rather let us say uh, from nuclear disarmament. You know, India has talked about a, a world without nuclear weapons uh, to nuclear arms control, which was the INF and the START Treaty and the whole strategic stability regime between the United States and Soviet Union and uh, with Russia to the concept of risk reduction. So, are you giving up the prospect of uh, disarmament? None at all. Nuclear risk reduction measures are not an alternative to the elimination of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. as outlined in the Article 6 of NPT mm -hmm. and as uh, uh, declared uh, as a as an international law by the passing of the treaty for the prohibition, prohibition yes. of nuclear weapons in 2017 by the UN. So, there is in the long run, there is no alternative to the abolition of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. We must make a world free of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and, 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 and there is no alternative to that. But in the short run, yeah. until you achieve that objective, mm -hmm. we can't have the world blown up, uh, you of know, course. due to some accident in Ukraine war or due to some tension between US and China. So, do you think uh, on a realistic plane, I mean, we are still at the, discussing the nuclear, 
I would like to also discuss with you uh, the emerging technologies which you right. briefly mentioned. But on the nuclear, uh, in the context of Ukraine and the last developments of the last 12 months, realistically, based on your own experience and discussions with Western counterparts, do you actually see any risk of a nuclear, uh, the war escalating to a nuclear level in Ukraine? I don't, uh, I don't foresee that possibility immediately, mm. but I wouldn't rule it out. Mm. Uh, yeah. If somehow NATO gets involved in this war directly, mm. there is a risk that, that we might uh, mm. have a nuclear confrontation. Okay. Then on the emerging uh, technologies uh, part, which I found the most interesting that, you know, you've mentioned some, but I also noticed from your book, you know, you've mentioned lethal autonomous weapons, which are, you know, probably in the harpy killer robots right. and loitering munition. You've talked about the cyber weaponry, uh, space weapons, biological weapons, artificial intelligence. So clearly, I think what you are saying in the book is that like nuclear science and technology, when these technologies become available, then uh, it is difficult to control their military application and use, right? Uh, I mean, we all know the civilian applications, but I think your worry seems to be in the book that if we do not find a regime to control the military application, then we could be getting into even more serious problems. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think that's what... Exactly. I fully agree with you. We, we need a global regime to regulate the use of emerging technologies in their application to the weapons of final destruction mm. or even weapons of mass destruction. Mm. We yeah. absolutely need a global regime. Mm. And I think India and other countries should take a lead mm. in ushering in this regime. Mm. And it's in our national self-interest. Mm. And I'll tell you why. We were nowhere there when NPT was uh, negotiated. Correct. And we ended up having a discriminatory uh, NPT, which draws an artificial uh, yeah. uh, uh, line yeah. on a uh, path of history. And you are on the wrong side of that line. Right. The, the haves and the have-nots. Uh, the haves and the have-nots. So, and, and there will be, there is so much demand growing up in the US and Western Europe and, and growing awareness in Russia and China about the dangers of emerging technologies that at some stage there will be a regime. Mm -hmm. But do you want to be an observer when that regime is shaped by the established powers or do we want to be a leader in shaping the regime to make sure that it is universally fair and non-discriminatory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a big point. That's really a big point uh, that uh, do you learn lessons from history uh, and forecast uh, the future threats and get into the standard setting the making of the international laws, N norms, norms. Exactly. Um, uh, that's uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, how do you see uh, in terms of our own neighborhood, the capabilities of our adversaries, basically China and Pakistan, who are nuclear weapon states, uh, on on this uh, on their capabilities in these domains? I mean, we have seen some aspects on the Chinese side, but uh, particularly on the Pakistani side, uh, how do you see that? Uh, their capabilities developing because you know that is something that directly affects us well i think nuclear war anywhere in the world whether in this region or 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 globally or between us and russia or us and china will start either by accident or by incident or by intent mm. any of these three possibilities are there mm. and i wouldn't completely rule out the possibility of a nuclear war between India and Pakistan. Oh, really? Either due to accident or incident, mm -hmm. not due to intent. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the Indian leadership, of course, is mature with regards to managing nuclear relationship with Pakistan. But I think even in Pakistan, uh, there is no particular uh, 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 desire to invite a nuclear annihilation. So I have but by accident or by 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 incident is something that we cannot totally rule out. That is possible. And it can happen any which ways. If, for example, Pakistan sponsored agencies uh, target major cities in India in terrorist attacks, not with nuclear weapons, with uh, 
you know normal terrorist yeah. kind of attack yeah. Yeah. and inflict uh, damage of uh, several hundred people in in major cities india will have to retaliate uh, with conventional weapons and if india retaliates mm. conventional weapons in an atmosphere which is emotionally surcharged mm. in india mm. and of course the pakistan established will will make sure that mm. their atmosphere is also emotionally surcharged you never know when you will cross the ladder mm. which goes from the nuclear uh, from the conventional to the nuclear so you could yeah. have an inadvertent uh, uh, nuclear war no, not planned not premeditated yeah. but accidental mm. so tell me about two more things uh, when you talk about uh, the risk factor have you done any studies or any work to assess the security of nuclear weapons inside pakistan in terms of the safeguards in terms of command and control in terms of uh, technological uh, basically the whole question of nuclear security that's the first and second is on the uh, china pakistan nuclear uh, access and uh, strategic cooperation uh, in terms of uh, both uh, nuclear uh, civilian and uh, military uh, build up of pakistan how is it uh, looking to you see i haven't uh, done the study of pakistan's nuclear weapons management mm. in a sense that i don't have the access to the yeah. uh, 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 to their internal development but the americans are following it up very closely mm. and i had conversation with the american experts who are following and they they seem little worried but mostly mm-hmm. satisfied that uh, so long as the military is in uh, control mm-hmm. of nuclear weapons mm-hmm. um, uh, there should not be much of a risk of a misadventure mm-hmm. but the question of the nature of pakistani state in future yeah it's something uh, uh, we have no answer to yeah if the very character of the regime changes mm. i'm not talking about 2 years or 3 years i'm looking down 5 years 10 years 15 years if the character of the regime changes if you have a, uh, an orthodox regime religious orthodox regime and if the regime changes even the military becomes subservient mm-hmm. to such a regime uh, then you never know mm. uh, what would be the situation with uh, uh, the command and control but pakistan from what i can read doesn't have many capabilities with regards to artificial intelligence mm. lethal autonomous weapons and these other mm. uh, uh, kind of new technologies mm. so pakistan has the the, the usual mm. nuclear mm. weapons and missiles but china uh, it's is well ahead of even us and russia mm. in some respects with regards to the emerging technologies so what do you make of uh, this american demand particularly during the trump administration Uh, that uh, in the future america russia strategic talks on nuclear control uh, and disarmament china must be a part of it it's a non starter <laughs> because because no no the reason is because this demand is focused on new start treaty mm. and the new start treaty uh, basically decides how many nuclear weapons nuclear warheads uh, can be placed on alert mm. in a what they call a hair trigger position ready to go so within 10 minutes of executive order the nuclear warhead will be uh, mm-hmm. starting off in the direction of its target mm-hmm. and that number is fixed to uh, fixed at around 2800 mm-hmm. 1400 with uh, uh, united yeah. states and 1400 yeah. with uh, uh, russia now the americans are saying that in the new start treaty china should be included mm-hmm. but china doesn't have any weapons mm-hmm. placed on the hair trigger alert so the only two countries which have i mean india doesn't have either so the only two countries which have got the weapons placed on the hair trigger alert mm-hmm. are the us and russia so obviously the yeah. effort to involve china are not going to go uh, too far but you know i was reading the latest uh, cpri handbook for 2023 so in their assessment they say that uh, there is a very significant expansion going on of chinese nuclear weapon capability and in terms of the numbers and the warheads and capabilities added to their uh, rapid uh, growth in their emerging technology sphere so china is uh, you know poised and is planning uh, to become uh, a much more lethal uh, power both in the nuclear space and the emerging technology no space. there is no doubt about that at all yeah but see chinese nuclear warheads are about 300 mm-hmm. 
now the cipri assessment and the american assessment is that over the next few years three, this 300 can become 600 and 600 can become 1200 mm -hmm. so that's the general uh, assessment the american and the russian warheads are between them roughly 9000 mm -hmm. which are in active military service mm -hmm. So, 9,000 warheads are say 4,500 roughly of Russia, 4,500 of United States. As compared to that, say 300, even if they are going to yeah, 450, yeah, yeah. then Chinese warheads are still one tenth. No, but you're um, right. I mean, but 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 they are. But but that is why they are making up in the in the technology. In the emerging technology. In the emerging tech technology. So Chinese have uh, hypersonic missiles. You know, it's very interesting. You have to see the 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 parade that the that the Chinese have on the anniversary of the mm -hmm. Communist Party's founding. So they they display their missiles, and the Chinese everything that they write about China, everything they do about the China is in Chinese language. But only these advanced missiles they are named in English. Mm -hmm. So so what is the signal? Mm -hmm. I mean the Chinese are very proud of their culture, they are very proud of sure. their language, and sure. and everything is in Chinese. Sure. But sure. but the missiles are named in English. Mm -hmm. So basically they are telling the world mm -hmm. that this is what we have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm. uh, and and you be careful. But mm. let's not forget just one other dimension. And since we are talking about China, and China could be particularly uh, having a uh, tremendous uh, lethality mm -hmm. uh, potentially. And that is biotechnology also. Mm. It's not just uh, nuclear weapons and AI mm. and lethal autonomous weapons, but biotechnology is also progressing in a, mm. in a dangerous direction. I mean, biotechnology is very good for medicines, correct, for correct, correct. human welfare, but there is another aspect that the biotechnology can be misused. So, with biotechnology, you have a possibility of creating artificial genome, mm. and that's already been achieved in Craig Venter Laboratory in the US. You have a possibility of making a chimera, which is you take the human genes with an animal gene and you make a combined gene, and the Chinese are doing that, mm. and you don't have any information on what kind of a uh, 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 progress they have achieved. Mm -hmm. We know they have done it. They have combined uh, mm -hmm. uh, human human genes with the cow genes and created mm -hmm. a third kind of uh, an animal or a, or, or a being. You can say you can't call it a human. You can't call it yeah. animal and being. Uh, UK is also doing it, but UK this kind of scientific research are certain regulations uh, which have been imposed by the House of Commons mm -hmm. by a resolution that was passed in 2017 or 2018. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese don't have democracy and you yeah. don't really know yeah. uh, what is happening behind the Iron Curtain. And then there is the uh, using artificial intelligence to uh, manipulate the genes. Mm. So there are all these dangers in biotechnology also. No, that's, uh, I, you know, the fact that you're talking about all this in the book and otherwise, I think is very, very important because coming from civil society, from someone who understands and has thought about it is really important because even in India, I think we must have much greater awareness. And uh, so, so uh, on, 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 on this note, uh, let me just say uh, to you that I think India has no shortcuts except to ratchet up, ratchet up its uh, game on the emerging technologies uh, front uh, because that is the future and that is the way in which this juggernaut is proceeding. And India has to develop its own capabilities if it has to be one step ahead to secure itself. And number two, as you said, has to be in the negotiating rooms exactly. and uh, be there. Uh, we, we cannot afford to stand aside. So uh, let me just say thank you, uh, Sandeep, and I, and I wish you all the best for future endeavors. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure being with you. And... Uh... I wish happy journey to Nostrad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye.